Kia ora koutou. I'm Sean Davis, an Enterprise Advisor at Venture Taranaki, and you're joining us for the fourth Ahead of the Curve webinar, brought to you by Venture Taranaki in partnership with the Regional Business Partners Network. As of this week, Venture Taranaki have issued over $360,000 worth of funding that will be used towards professional services and advice, such as you'll be hearing today from Gavette Quilliam. Please remember, we're always here to support our enterprises, so if you need any support or help, please reach us through our website at business.taranaki.info and we'll get in touch. If this is the first time that you've joined for one of our webinars, please remember you can also visit our website and find any previous recordings. So just search ahead of the curve at our website and you'll find those. Now today, we have an information-filled session with Troy Wano, Alice Tosha, and Rebecca Eaton from Gavette Quilliam discussing business continuity. The team will cover what funding is available to you, the topic of employment law, and also your options with commercial leases. We also have Adam Harris joining us today to help facilitate the session. Over to you, Adam, to run through some nuts and bolts of the webinar. Fantastic, thank you, Sean. Good morning, everybody. For those of you that are here for the first time or a renewal for other people, Three things I just want to alert you to. So top right hand corner, you'll have a thing that says either speaker view or gallery view. This will give you the opportunity to see who's speaking or the gallery of all of the panelists here today. Two other things, the, th uh, the first thing is on the bottom row, you'll see something that says chat. Please open the chat box, look at the blue tab and uh, toggle it to where it says all panelists and attendees. And if you could just put your name and the company that you're from, just gives us a great opportunity to see who's online now. And the third and probably the most important thing is the Q&A box. Uh, if you can open that up, it will be a separate pop-up box. This will give you the chance to see, but also to write questions that you have for our panelists today. And I'm sure because of the subject matters, you're gonna have a lot. Please type your questions in. And as the panelists are going through their presentation, they'll be able to answer the questions throughout. So without further ado, I'll over, hand over to Troy, who will introduce uh, the three speakers today and go through from there. Troy. Uh, kia ora Adam, kia ora koutou, no mo aramai everyone. Uh, my name is Troy Wanoa, I'm a partner at Govett Quilliam and uh, will be part of the discussion today on our topic, business continuity. Um, I thought just start the session off today with a um, big fat loyally caveat on everything we're about to say in what is an ever-changing world um, it's fair to say especially on some of the topics like um, my topic on level two uh, we expect some of that change to happen already later on this afternoon at today's briefing um, so really the idea of today is to uh, talk about what we currently know and what's currently on the horizon um, also discuss some of the the learnings we have all uh, gathered over the last six weeks, and then also just with a little bit of an eye to the future. Uh, so just in terms of um, uh, introducing the team, uh, we'll start with me. Um, I lead our employment team and um, have been here in my garage for the last six weeks, uh, dealing with all sorts of um, lockdown related employment issues. So I'll, I'll share some of my stories there and also talk a little bit about uh, level two uh, be before we start potentially pivoting in that direction next week. Uh, next speaker is Rebecca Eaton. Uh, Rebecca is an associate at Govett Quilliam. Uh, she works uh, across a number of our teams, but um, has become our lockdown guru, um, has been following the announcements from day one and um, is our go-to per person for anything COVID-19 related. Uh, so she'll be talking about um, the various government initiatives, many of which you likely have already applied for. Um, and then on top of that, we'll talk about some of the um, proposed legislative changes affecting businesses. Uh, second speaker is Alice Tocker. Um, Alice is a long-standing partner at Govett Quilliam. She leads our uh, private client and property teams. And I know that she's been very busy um, last six weeks at home, uh, dealing with her husband and her two young children, as well as a very challenging uh, residential conveyancing market um, and uh, commercial property issues as well. And she'll be dealing with that very vexed question of 
uh, commercial leases in a, a COVID-19 world. And then I will again just touch on um, employment issues. So pass over to, to Rebecca. Good everyone. As Troy said, my name is Rebecca Eaton. I'm an associate here at Givet Quilliam. And I'm going to briefly run through some of the key aid packages and initiatives that are available both through the government and locally. Um, so I'm just about to, to share our screen and our PowerPoint that we've prepared. So Adam, yell out if there's any issues there. So just diving right in, firstly, I'll touch on the wage subsidy, which I'm sure many of you are quite familiar with by now. So this was initiated on the 17th of March, so before we went into lockdown. It's available to businesses who suffer a revenue loss of 30% due to COVID-19 in any four week period between January and 9 June this year. It covers a 12, 12 week period being 585.80 gross per week for all full-time employees and $350 gross per week for part-time employees. So given that this has been in place for almost two months now, there may be some of you who have been in receipt of the wage subsidy and are nearing or past the midway point of that relevant 12 week period. However, the scheme is still open to be applied for if you haven't applied for yet and if you think that you are eligible. It is just important to make sure that you really understand that eligibility criteria and any obligations that you may have if you do apply for and receive um, the subsidy, particularly the circumstances in which you may be required to pay that subsidy back. And Troy will be touching on that uh, later in the webinar. Moving on to the Essential Workers Leave Scheme. This is available for employers who may have employees who need to stay away from work and are unable to work from home uh, due to self-isolation requirements or Ministry of Health guidelines. So that includes those who have contracted COVID-19, have been in close contact with a confirmed case, are high risk or are, have a household member who is deemed high risk. Um, so the payments available are the same as those under the wage subsidy scheme but it is important that you can't double dip here. So if you're already in receipt of the wage subsidy scheme for that particular employee, you can't then go ahead and apply for the uh, essential workers leave payments as well. So then just moving on to some of the loan schemes that the government has made available in the last uh, few weeks and months. First up, we have one that was announced just last week, which uh, is the COVID-19 small business cash flow scheme. So this is a interest-free loan for small and medium businesses. It is 100% government funded uh, and it's available for businesses who employ 50 or less full-time equivalent employees. The eligibility criteria is pretty much the same as the wage subsidy scheme, so a 30% loss in revenue due to COVID-19. Uh, businesses can apply for up to $100,000 in this loan scheme. That's made up of 10,000 for every firm and an additional 1,800 per uh, full-time equivalent employee. So the scheme is interest-free if it's paid back within a year. Otherwise, the interest rate is at 3% for a maximum term of five years. So importantly for the scheme, the point is to assist businesses with their core operating costs and to get them through this period, particularly where their cash flow may be down. Uh, so businesses applying under the scheme need to declare that they're a viable business and that they'll use the money for core business operating costs. And IRD has indicated that application should be available uh, from 12th of May next week. Um, so if this is something you're interested in, keep an eye on IRD's site and their communications um, and yeah, go from there. Uh, this uh, interest-free scheme is on top of the Business Finance Guarantee Scheme, which was announced last month. Uh, and this is a joint initiative between the government and approved banks. So this, uh, uh, businesses that are eligible are those with annual revenue, uh, annual revenue of up to 80 million a year. Um, and they can apply to their banks for loans of up to $500,000 for a term of up to three years. Uh, it's important to note the originally the eligibility criteria had a minimum turnover uh, requirement of $250,000 a year, 
uh, but last week the government announced that they would be removing that minimum requirement so that smaller businesses could now access this scheme. Uh, so that's just a recent change that's been made. Uh, under the scheme, the government's guarantee, guaranteeing 80% of the risk and the banks are covering the remaining 20%. Uh, normal credit assessment processes apply, um, but of course banks will be taking into account where your business circumstances have been impacted or affected due to COVID-19. Uh, again, interest rates are determined by banks under the normal lending criteria. Um, some activities are excluded from the loan scheme. So this includes some property development and investment businesses and tobacco manufacturers. Uh, originally, the exceptions included agricultural businesses, but again last week the government has made a further announcement that agricultural businesses are now no longer excluded under the scheme. So those businesses can now apply. Um, and finally, uh, this is av available to be applied for until 30th of September uh, at this date. So with these loan schemes, we'd always recommend that if this is something you're considering or if you think would be appropriate for your business, that you get in touch with your appropriate uh, financial advisors, whether that's your accountants and of course your bank, um, to see whether it's something that would be suitable for your business. Uh, moving on to legislation changes. Uh, yesterday, the government, not yesterday, sorry, Tuesday, the government introduced the COVID-19 response further management measures legislation bill to Parliament. And that includes a number of proposed changes to a really large number of pieces of legislation uh, that impact businesses. In particular, there are some proposed amendments to insolvency and company law, uh, including a safe harbour from insolvency related directors duties. Uh, this means that certain decisions made by directors between April and the end of September this year will not amount to breaches of directors' duties in certain circumstances. Uh, secondly, there's, it also introduces a business debt hibernation scheme, and this allows companies to enter into agreements with their creditors in relation to existing debts. Um, and this includes the potential for a moratorium placed on any enforcement action uh, for a period of six months if a business is placed into business debt hibernation. Uh, secondly, there's some amendments that have been proposed to commercial property law, uh, including amendments to extend the arrears period before uh, commercial landlords can cancel commercial leases. And on the flip side, amendments to extend the notice period before mortgagees can seek to sell or repossess any property. Uh, this is particularly relevant where obviously we're seeing commercial uh, tenants struggling to, to make rent payments and then conversely commercial landlords are struggling to service their mortgages. Uh, so that will provide some assistance there and uh, Alice will be talking shortly uh, in a bit more detail about commercial leases and your options there. Uh, moving on to any new potential initiatives the government may uh, introduce. This is obviously a moving beast uh, and uh, circumstances are changing all the time. However, the government has indicated that it is considering options to support New Zealand businesses with commercial rent payments. Uh, and that includes the possibility of uh, further amendments to the Property Law Act to guide commercial landlords and tenants with negotiating rent concessions. Um, so the government has said that they are considering, considering the new Australian model which is a mandatory code of conduct where commercial landlords are required to negotiate with tenants if they are eligible for Australia's JobKeeper program, which is essentially the equivalent of our wage subsidy scheme, uh, and have turnover of less than $50 million Australian per year. Uh, so these landlords are required to reduce rent proportional to the trading loss that the tenant may be seeing. Uh, the government has also indicated that there may be further industry specific assistance, particularly for industries who've been really hard hit by COVID-19. And that may be uh, uh, industries that were unable to operate at level three. Uh, and just finally, we also have some great local initiatives that are available uh, that you can look into. We've got the Venture Taranaki Professional Services Grant for small to medium business enterprises which is up to $800 of professional services advice for small to medium enterprises. If this is something you're interested in, please contact Venture Taranaki. 
similarly, we have the TSB Community Trust not-for-profit grant, which offers $800 of professional service advice for not-for-profit businesses who have been impacted by COVID-19. And if this is something that applies to you and you're interested in, uh, please contact the TSB Community Trust. Uh, and I've got the email there. Uh, GQ is a, uh, a confirmed uh, provider for both these schemes. So that's, just, that's it from me. Um, key takeaways, just make sure that you're aware of all the key business aid packages that are out there. There's quite a few. Um, and just check to see whether you're eligible. Uh, and do contact and communicate with your professional advisors, being you know, your accountants, uh, your banks, and your lawyers to see whether that's appropriate for your business. Um, I'll, that's it from me, so I'll hand over to Alice. Fantastic, Rebecca. Just before Alice goes, um, the questions are coming in. Keep them coming. Uh, Rebecca and uh, the rest of the team will be answering those as we go. Uh, and Alice, when you're ready, if you could just mention the poll and we'll get that launched as well. Alice. Thanks, Adam, and thanks, Rebecca. Uh, no doubt this, this group is well aware of the effects uh, that the restrictions of lockdown and Alert Level 3 have um, had on businesses. Um, most people have suffered a drop in revenue and cash flow drying up. Um, and this, of course, has a knock-on effect uh, to those businesses' landlords, where um, the expense line um, in your budget around rent, you're looking at it go thinking, what can we do to, to reduce that? And landlords are, are relying on that income for their, their own um, borrowing obligations. In that uh, vein, we have a poll about commercial leases, which Adam's going to start now. So I'll let you guys answer that as you please. Uh, so what, what can we do? What can businesses and landlords do in these unprecedented circumstances? So a, a standard legal response is always, what is the base document that basically forms a relationship between the landlord and the tenant? And that's your lease. It's really important that you look at your existing lease and read through the terms to understand what, if any, um, provisions are in there in relation to these circumstances. There are a number of different leases um, in use in New Zealand, but the most commonly used one is the ADLS deed of lease. And the sixth edition form is the one that we've heard a lot about in the news. And that does include some no access um, provisions um, in the result of an emergency. There are uh, the other forms of lease though that unfortunately don't include these uh, specific terms. The, the current form of ADLS lease was introduced as a response to the Christchurch earthquakes and that in the situation where the emergency red zone cordon in the central city prevented tenants from being able to access their premises. The ADLS includes clauses 27.5 and 27.6 and they deal with no access to premises in an emergency. These, where these clauses apply, uh, there is a provision uh, for an abatement of a fair proportion of rent and outgoings. So the question is, what constitutes fair proportion? And, and that's going to vary in, in the different circumstances of um, the tenant and of the landlord. So in the next slide, we have a number of considerations that you can take into account when trying to determine what is a fair proportion. So we'll just jump to the next slide. Thanks, Rebecca. So there's a number of considerations there. A fair proportion should be fair, having regard to the circumstances of both the landlord and the tenant. We need to consider the extent to which the tenant is still using the premises for some purposes. Uh, some essential services have continued to be able to use their premises how much time remains on the term of the lease, the nature of the premises and the proportionate change in use and enjoyment of those premises while in lockdown, uh, whether the tenant's able to conduct business remotely or not. And we know with a number of offices, for example, have their servers located in the premises but have continued to connect remotely to them. The, the value inherent in the premises, like fit out, storage, goodwill, branding, and exposure, the rights of termination if non-access continues, the tenant's ability to 
continue its business. The impact of the tenant's ongoing viability if it is required to pay rent, and you should take into account the government assistance available as Rebecca's um, set out. The financial position and commitments of the landlord um, is the property mortgaged. And it's also important to note that likely business land, uh, sorry, landlord's business interruption insurance won't cover the situation as there's usually an exclusion in those policies in relation to pandemics and notifiable diseases. The landlord's costs in holding and managing the property, uh, again, mortgage obligations and other costs such as ground rent or insurance. And the fair, fair proportion may differ as between rent and outgoings. What constitute, constitutes fair proportion is, is likely to change as we move through the alert levels. For example, under alert level three, when we consider some of the main categories of commercial tenants, many hospitality and retail tenants are now operating from their premises, but in a limited capacity. They're able to provide contactless pickup for online orders. And while this may allow for part of their premises to be used, like the kitchen, um, or for a retail tenant, the storage space, it's not a full operation of the tenant's business um, or the premises. So there's the argument that a proportion of the rent um, should still cease to be payable under this current alert level. Office tenants, for example, are now able to access their premises, but uh, they can't operate fully in that they aren't able to admit customers or clients, and they must maintain physical distancing. Some office tenants may be able to fully operate uh, where they seldom admit customers or clients or have workstations already sufficiently separated. So depending on the level to which the tenants are able to operate, a fair proportion of the rent and outgoings may still cease to be payable. Many warehousing and industrial tenants are now operating, although in a, again in a limited capacity. So each tenancy really needs to be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis uh, as to the extent that the tenant's able to operate from the premises. We have some examples of um, reductions in the market now, which are just on the next slide. So the property law section, which is a subcommittee of the New Zealand Law Society, has gathered, gathered a feedback from a number of lawyers around the country who have negotiated on behalf of vendors and, and landlords. So these can only really serve as, uh, as starting points for tenants and landlords, but that's what we really need. Uh, locally, we're seeing a real mix of responses from landlords and tenants. Interestingly, in relation uh, to the landlords and tenants we've been in contact with, the parties seem to be agreeing to some form of rent reduction, regardless of whether the lease includes the no access provisions. The general starting point seems to be stemming from a share the pain philosophy, starting at around 50% during alert level four, and any movement from that arrangement in alert level three has been entirely dependent on the business. But just as some examples, we're seeing retail and hospitality businesses maintaining a rent at 50% during alert level three, um, some trade, trade and dispatches moving to around 85% and offices to around 65%. We, where, where you don't have an ADLS lease, the sixth edition with the no access clauses, or it's a non-ADLS lease, um, unfortunately the, the position's less, less clear, particularly for tenants. Um, generally ADLS leases entered into prior to 2012 and non-ADLS leases don't include no access clauses. Um, and we with, with these with these leases, there is no real contractual remedy available to tenants who have been prevented from accessing uh, their premises. Uh, in this situation, we, we're recommending that tenants communicate with their landlords, outline their financial position, and provide some kind of proposal about a way forward um, and basing that on a commercial fairness approach. A commercial deal may be able to be struck and there are options available despite the strict legal position. Some of the op options that you can consider um, together with your, your landlord, rent abatement, 
uh, so and take into account some of the fair proportion considerations we've just I've discussed a little earlier. Rent payment holidays, um, an interim agreement such as a deferred rent payment plan. It may be that after discussing uh, the financial position of the business, the the parties agree to an early termination of the lease. Uh, a variation of the of the lease, like deferring a rent review date, or an extension to the lease term and return for relief. Uh, in exercising any of these options, you are able to reserve your rights to review the contractual position and seek a refund or, or repayment down the track. Regardless of the lease terms, we are seeing landlords that are keen to find a way to accommodate uh, their tenants and to secure their rent roll in the long term. So even if a tenant has no right to abatement under a lease, it may be that the landlord is willing to allow rent to abate or to be deferred. And in the medium to long term, this is likely to be in everyone's interest. I'll pass on now to Troy, who's going to give us a bit more information on employment law. Thanks. Uh, just before we come to Troy, I just want to give you the, uh, the results of the poll. Has your business negotiated your commercial lease? 46% uh, said yes, 10% in the process now, 44% say that they don't need to. Um, Alice, there's a couple of questions in the, uh, the Q&A if you could uh, take those. Um, and there's also a couple in the chat box as well. Uh, Troy, over to you. Thanks again, Adam. Um, okay, I'll just start off with dealing briefly with Alert Level 2 and very conscious of the fact that uh, what I'm about to say may well be superseded in about an hour's time when we have our government briefing at one o'clock, um, just particularly around alert level two. So um, I think to use a sporting reference, if um, think of the next 10 minutes as a bit of a warm up to the main event in about an hour's time, um, because clearly in terms of level two, it's been flagged up as that as being the um, one of the possibilities next week. Um, and so I'm sure uh, businesses have already started as we have getting their heads around what might be required. So let's just start off for now, just uh, dealing with what we know. Um, and also just appreciating that the guidelines around level two were formed obviously, um, for those who can remember back that far, uh, when the alert level system was put in place on the 21st of March, and um, we went from um, the announcement about the alert level system on that same day to alert level two, and then went very quickly to alert level three and four. Uh, what we've learnt is that um, the reverse process going, dropping through the gears will be a much more considered and drawn out process. Um, and clearly, the government has learnt a lot in the last six weeks and so likely some of the things that were flagged up as being part of a level two um, pre-lockdown may well be um, up for a, a change later on this afternoon or at least a fleshing out but in terms of businesses what we can say now is that most businesses will be open at level two um, so you can open up the workplace to staff and to customers with appropriate measures. So by now we will have had, have had drummed into us um, the importance of proper hygiene and of distancing. So we know, for example, on the basis of the current guidelines at least, that once you step outside your house, outside your bubble, uh, one metre distancing will apply and that will likely have to carry over into the workplace. So uh, initially we were encouraged to consider alternative ways of working and that would include of course effectively what I and many others have been doing for the last six weeks, well not necessarily working out of their garage, but working remotely. So um, it may well be that that remains part of the discussion. I guess in terms of the alternative ways, if you are a small business, one, two, three people, um, this process may, may well be relatively straightforward, um, but gets more complicated um, the greater your workforce is. And then 
more complicated still if you're working in a largely collaborative workplace. So remote working may still be an option. And the other um, issues that were, were flagged up were shift-based working. And again, this is um, primarily for larger workplaces, shift-based working, physical distancing, and I just touched on the uh, one meter guideline. Um, and then also staggering meal break, breaks. I've also mentioned flexible leave, albeit I dare say by now, um, six weeks into lockdown, issues around leave have been well and truly exhausted by now, or at least the discussion. So um, uh, the intention I understand this afternoon is to flesh out a lot more in terms of um, level two. And so just quickly going on to the next slide, um, there are some other key issues that need to come into the picture as well. Uh, the education sector, clearly there was a lot of anxiety um, last well, two weeks previously amongst all the key stakeholders, uh, teachers, school boards, parents around um, uh, how the school environment would work at level three and that anxiety has only increased over the last um, a week during the course of this week. And um, I note that the uh, education ministry has not said much over the last few days. So likely um, some of these key sectors, education and so on, there'll be a lot more greater guidance um, following on from today. Um, and I think just the other thing I've got in my bullet point there, just to be aware, and um, you know, I've had a number of discussions with people, particularly in the essential services, of teasing out issues with some of your staff who might be high risk or might be caring for people who are high risk, have existing medical conditions, um, that uh, they may well ha have already signaled that to you. So I think um, the key part um, in dealing with your staff with all, all of these issues is making sure that you have a um, dialogue and conversation with them. But just noticing also in that last sentence, the government made very clear um, uh, that staff may also in those uh, who might be affected, might be high risk, may also choose to work. So these are the issues that will likely be teased out from this afternoon. Um, I think there are a number of other aspects of level two, such as gatherings, um, up to 100 people indoors, $500, 500 people rather outdoors. Some of that might be questioned, um, as well as I know another big topic will be the issue of avoiding um, uh, non-essential travel interregionally. Um, I know a lot of our hospitality and tourism operations would like to see that open, so I dare say there'll be some guidance around that from this afternoon onwards. Um, just moving on quickly to our next slide. Um, I think one of the issues uh, that the government has uh, been careful to uh, keep in the forefront of the minds of employers right through lockdown is uh, the notion or the idea that employment law hasn't changed even though we're in uncharted territory. So I talk briefly there about good faith um, and um, a lot of the uh, questions and queries I've had over the last six weeks have been around uh, shortening, um, shortening that consultation process. And I think probably the key thing in that is that um, anytime you're making those key decisions that affect either salary or um, continuity of employment retention, um, you're going to have to have a robust process. And so um, if you think of it in terms of a lot of the information that you're going to need to share with your staff will be information you already have. Um, so in terms of by, by now, six weeks down the track, um, being, um, having all those discussions with your bank manager, your landlords, um, your finance people, your accountants, just in terms of your financial position, you'll have that information available to you. 
Now, you don't necessarily have to open up the books to your staff, but you do. there does need to be a level of transparency with your staff. Um, and then the other side of that is also giving staff a genuine opportunity to give feedback. And I have encountered a lot of situations, um, particularly within our local business community of um, employees being very trans transparent about the information that they provide. Um, and bearing in mind that there's a lot of information out there as well. Um, but also, um, staff being engaged and, and coming up with uh, alternative ideas in, in the short term. So particularly as things remain uncertain, I think that will be um, another, another factor to consider going forward. Now, I'm being waved in slightly here, so I'm going to rein in the next of this very quickly. So if we just go through, um, I think we've touched on wage subsidies, so we can just move through that. And I know that there's been some questions on that already, and I think we can deal with that in question time. So we just go through to the next slide. Um, again, this is just around reinforcing what I'm sure people already know about their obligation to repay back the subsidy. If, for example, uh, you were in that situation where you predicted loss of revenue of up to 30%, but haven't quite got there and may not get, get there by the time the current scheme is in place, which is to 9 June. And I've been telling employers to keep that pool of money aside just in case. Um, and then I'll just quickly go through to our next slide, just to quickly wrap things up, which is just to ask that question, which is really um, more navel gazing on my part, really. I think primarily for all of us, the focus is on the here and now. And, and literally the here and now, in about an hour's time when we get um, the fleshing out of level two. And over the next uh, week, Monday, when um, we get this decision as to whether we go to level two or not, um, or, there, or there is some other graduated process. So, so, so absolutely, for now, um, it's about getting ourselves through the next part of this lockdown process. Um, but also just bearing in mind and keeping in mind, as I have, that uh, we've all been conducting this big experiment effectively for the last six weeks. And there's two parts to how we kind of operate next. It's the internal things dealing with our staff, which I've touched on, but also um, our clients, um, because their expectations will have also changed. I've had some interesting discussions, sharing stories with staff about how they've managed to, um, sorry, with clients, how they've adapted to using forums like this, particularly for people who aren't particularly tech savvy like myself, how they've managed to um, figure out how this, th these forums can help us, even for clients who a lot of their work is site specific, but actually it's a great way to, um, to, to take pressure off them. Um, so I think we just have to be mindful of also what our clients' expectations are. So I'll leave it there. Um, and then just kind of open things up a little bit. Fantastic. Um, Troy, um, don't underestimate, you're absolutely tech savvy now. I think you're doing yourself a disservice. Um, you're doing really well. Um, look, I wanna make sure that we get the questions that we've got on the screen covered uh, before 12.15. Um, I think what we'll then do is we will continue the conversation because we are covering a lot. I wanna make sure that we cut, we, we verbalize some of the things that have been coming through. So if, if people have to drop off at 12.15, please do so, but we will continue the conversation for at least another 10, 15 minutes. Um, Alice, um, question that's come through. Is there any feedback on abandonment percentage for motels? No, I don't have that, sorry, at the moment, um, but we can have a look into it and come back to you. Fantastic. So. Um, Tricia, if you just want to kind of drop uh, Alison uh, an email. In fact, can I ask all of the um, the panelists, can you just put your contact details in the chat box just that if people do want to reach out to you, they can do. Um, Troy, on this one, um, do you have a prediction uh, on what's going to happen with regards to kind of regional travel? Um, look, I, the only, <laughs> no, I don't have a crystal ball, but um, I think, <laughs> Well, the, the one thing we can we can safely say is that our, our government has been very, very cautious right throughout this whole process. So I think people will be um, eagerly awaiting whether we kind of open up at level two. As I sort of indicated, um, 
uh, I, I'm, I'm, I can't see them moving away from what they've currently uh, indicated at level two, that it's only going to be um, essential travel interregionally. Um, and it might not be until we get to level one before um, we see things open up a lot more. Okay. Um, next question. So can you use wage subsidy to support wages after 9th of June or not? Um, well, I guess that also depends on where you are in the scheme. Um, by 9 June, on my poor math, you're likely um, out of the scheme. I think probably, I'm not sure if Rebecca um, touched on it, but I, th I think the government's very mindful of what happens when we get to the end of the scheme. Um, and there is the possibility, I know it's been discussed, uh, if not by the government, by um, by other experts of the possibility of that scheme being rolled out further. I don't know. But then again, the scheme itself has, has come under a lot of heat in the last uh, couple of weeks. Just following up on that, can you predict what will happen in the next six months to one year in terms of employment law? Do you anticipate that things are going to change, adapt? Yeah, I, well, I think, I think um, I th you know, that point I was just touching on before, I think it's not just about our own workplaces. It's kind of, um, yeah, I don't want to use that word normal because I don't know what that means really anymore. I think things will be different. And I think the key for people will be um, whatever that future looks like, just being attuned to both your staff because if you take the staff issue, there's going to, like in a big workplace like ours, you're going to have a range of people who are just eager to get back into work, into, back into that workplace. At the other extent, extreme, you're going to have people who are incredibly anxious about getting back into work. Then there's questions of productivity. Staff may well have been productive while at home, in their garage maybe. But, um, and, then, and then also, like I said before, clients who've picked up, um, you know, just, and, and, and I literally have picked up a lot of this just in the last six weeks, and just making sure that you understand the key fundamentals and how it works, you know, key things like making sure you're fully dressed mm -hmm. when you're on Zoom, uh, all of those sorts of things. Um, I, I, I think um, clients' expectations, I think, will change also. So we've got to be attuned to that, all of us. Great. Um, so the, the results of the poll are in, will your business require further support with employment law? 7% uh, people said yes, 51% say potentially, 41% um, say no, currently feeling confident. Um, Sean, can just come to you? Obviously, we've got some experts on the line, but just help people understand how and where they need to go to get um, the support from VTT and wider. Yeah, absolutely. So as, as I said at the start of the webinar, you, if you visit our website at business.taranaki.info, get in touch and you can we can sort out we've got two pools we've got local funding through venture taranaki and then additionally if you need extra support through the regional business partners network there's a potential for an extra two thousand dollars worth of support so get in touch with us and there's lots of businesses like vivek william that have got um services ready to go fantastic so um we are just coming up before 12 15 uh, i've got another question that's come come through that i'm going to uh, ask the panel and then i'm going to also ask the panel just to give a summary of either the things that they've not covered that they want to share but also some of the questions that they've gone through uh, during the session uh, so if you do have to get off please do so uh, and there will be a recording that sean will send out later so the other question that's just come in if a 70 year old employee wants to return to the office, but their employer is concerned due to COVID risks, can they make them remain working from home during level two? Uh, I'll, ju I'll yeah. jump in there. Um, so obviously the 70 plus year olds are categorized as high risk by the Ministry of Health. Um, however, they, this is a bit of a complicated area. Uh, they're not required to stay home by the Ministry of Health. It's, it's, it's recommended that they limit their exposure uh, outside of their own homes and their own bubbles. Uh, so that can be a difficult issue. Uh, generally, if an employee is uh, willing and able to work, um, that means you, that you're required to pay them to do so. One thing to think about is whether they're able in any capacity to work from home. Um, and if that can be a little bit of a, a middle ground agreement that you can come to. But it is a complicated issue and, and I think 
continued and consistent communication uh, between the two of you will be important to try and resolve that issue there. Fantastic. Um, Troy, could you just put your email address in the chat box uh, so that people have got it? Alice, can I come to you? I know that you've been answering a couple of questions. Could you just share with us uh, kind of an overview of what you've been uh, doing uh, and then also just give us any final thoughts from you, please? Thanks, Adam. The, the, some of the questions coming through seems people are looking for some support in how to have those conversations with their landlords and, and what they need to say. Who, who's the best, best person to speak to to, to um, get some help with that? And naturally, I've said, come to your lawyer. Um, we're more than willing to help. Uh, it doesn't mean you have to um, get us to correspond with them. We can we can talk you through some of the, some of the options and then prep you for you to have that conversation. Um, if you need to, if we need to open up um, correspondence with their lawyers, we can. Um, but uh, my overriding message is communicate, communicate, communicate. Try and have some really good. Um, and reasonable, rational conversations with, with your landlord or your tenant. Explain each of your situations, you know, be honest and, um, and hopefully, if we all follow the Prime Minister's words of being kind, we um, will be able to come to, to an outcome that allows both parties to, to move forward. Great, thank you. Um, Rebecca, another cheeky question that's coming at the end, well, let's, uh, let's get it answered. Uh, when we return back to work, can we still pay the 80% or does it have to go to the 100%? Yeah, right. So the 80% is coming from the, the wage subsidy requirement where you have to make best endeavours to pay at least 80% of your employees' wages. Obviously, any change or reduction in wages has to be with the agreement of your staff. Uh, so that will depend on the agreement that you've come to with your employees. Um, if you're paying 80% at the moment, did you agree that that would have an end date? Would it be until the end of the lockdown? Um, so you need to look at that. Um, and if that has expired, you can always look to make further agreements with your employees to continue paying 80%. Uh, but it is important that you need to get that agreement. Um, so that will depend on, on the terms that you've agreed with your employees. You can always try and extend that agreement with, the agree uh, with again, the agreement of your employees. Fantastic. And Troy, final thoughts from you, please. Um, yeah, just, just to note that I know that... Um, uh, it's easy in these sort of times to be very anxious and concerned. Uh, we all are. Um, but I, I would have to say, just in terms of the interaction I've had with the business community, employers over the last six weeks, people have been generally um, supportive and quite positive. I think um, level two, we get the opportunity to get back into our workplaces in some form. Um, and it's just another opportunity for us to kind of... Um, you know, embrace where we are and and um, be amongst our community. Great. Um, if you could all put in the chat box, uh, what's the one takeaway that you've had from today's session? Um, thank you to our panelists. It's been this has been a really really interesting uh, session from multiple different angles. Um, Sean, closing thoughts from you and uh, close us out, please. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us, everyone, and especially to the team, Troy, Alice, and Rebecca. That was really insightful. There's, we've been handling a lot of phone calls, over, particularly over the last two weeks now, on employment law and property. So answering some of those questions today was really fantastic. Um, just to let everyone know, so this was recorded, so I will email out everyone a recording. And I'll also send you out an invitation to the next webinar. So it's going to be next Tuesday, the 12th of May at 11.30. So 11.30 every week. Um, this we next week, it's going to be hosted by Baker Tilly, covering practical how-to steps to understand your culture pre-COVID-19, develop an understanding of your desired culture, and key actions to shift from the current to the desired. So that will be really helpful next Tuesday the 12th of May at 11.30. Thanks everyone again for joining us and Heidi Dach.